start. Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the best session of the conference. OK. Uh, so uh, we're going to start with uh, our first uh, talk here on network security. Um, so Rob Jansen, who uh, works uh, at the US Naval Research Laboratory, uh, will, uh, uh, will tell us about how to measure something that you're not supposed to measure, namely Tor. Uh, and uh, Rob has been working at NRL for a while, and this is actually the place where Tor was, was, was created. So, Thank you. All right, so as Tudor mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk about safely measuring Tor. This is joint work with my colleague Aaron Johnson, who also works with me at NRL. Uh, so Tor is an anonymous communication system for censorship resistant and privacy enhancing communication. Tor is pretty popular. Tor itself estimates that they have 1.75 million users per day. And so you have a bunch of, of clients on the left who are going using Tor to visit various destinations on the right. And as you'll notice, there's a lot of connections going through that, that Tor cloud. So our goal is to understand what's happening inside of that cloud. How is Tor being used? Uh, how is Tor being misused? And how well is Tor performing? So the objective of our work is to safely gather Tor network usage statistics. And our approach is to use distributed measurement, secure multi-party computation, and differential privacy to do that. So I'm going to start by going, getting into a little bit of background about how Tor works, just enough to understand what we're measuring and why measurements are needed and some challenges involved in that. So Tor is based on the onion routing protocol. Uh, the way clients use Tor is they first build what's called a circuit through the network. They choose three relays, three Tor relays in the network, and they telescope a connection through these relays. At the end of this process, uh, the client will have a symmetric key with each of the relays, which they can use to encrypt uh, packets to each relay. Uh, once they build this circuit, they can then connect, instruct the last relay in the circuit to connect to an internet destination. And this end-to-end -end connection is called a stream. So a little bit more about how clients actually use circuits. So uh, all clients will begin their circuits with what's called uh, an entry guard. Uh, these are special relays in the network that have uh, specific properties. Clients will end their circuits with what's called an exit relay. Exit relays can specify exit policies which will allow the client to connect to different types of destinations or different ports. So they can specify that they only want to allow port 443, for example. Uh, clients then multiplex streams over the same circuit so they can connect to various destinations using that same circuit, depending on the exit policy of that circuit. So as long as the destination that it's connecting to uh, is supported by the exit node, the same circuit can be used. Uh, every 10 minutes, the circuits expire, and new circuits will replace existing ones. And finally, clients choose relays for these circuits weighted by the bandwidth capacity of the relays. This is done to help balance load among all the relays. OK, so we have all these relays in the network. Uh, how, do how do clients actually learn about them? This is a process that is uh, facilitated by nine directory authorities in the network. These are trusted. Um, relay operators who are running these authorities. The op operators will, or the authorities will look over all the relays that exist, and they vote on which relays are currently valid, stable, up and running, and they create what's called a network consensus uh, of these relays. This contains relay information such as IP address, public keys, bandwidths, et cetera, and there's also some performance parameters in the consensus document. This document is then distributed, uh, distributed to all of the clients, and the clients use that when they are building their circuits. So why are measurements needed of this? Uh, why are measurements of Tor needed? Uh, there's a variety of reasons to measure Tor. Uh, one is to understand how it's being used, and understanding usage behavior helps us focus efforts. So as a research community, by understanding how Tor is used, this helps us know which problems are important to look at. Uh, from the Tor project side itself, it helps them uh, put resources or money towards developing protocols in areas that we know there's, uh, there's uses or there's problems. Uh, understanding the network protocols also helps us collaborate existing algorithms that Tor is using, helps us calibrate parameters, 
And uh, measurements also help inform policy discussions so that policymakers are making, or uh, we can attempt to provide them with data so that they make uh, good decisions when they're making laws. Uh, Bruce Schneier summarized this pretty well. He says, Tor metrics are the ammunition that lets Tor and other security advocates argue for a more private and secure internet from a position of data rather than just dogma or perspective. So I think that uh, summarizes very well why we should measure, be measuring Tor. So there were some previous studies on measuring Tor, um, one in 2008 uh, by McCoy et al, one in 2010 by Shabain. Both of these works collected, stored, and manually analyzed sensitive data about the network. So in the McCoy study in 2008, they took a TCP dump of the first 150 bytes of a packet, including 96 payload or application header bytes. Uh, the later study in 2010 basically repeated that, but also used customized DPI software. They modified OpenDPI to uh, more accurately characterize the traffic. So both of these were ethical, were, had problems in terms of ethics, um, particularly in the 2008 study, was, uh, got a lot of backlash from the privacy community um, because of the way that they did TCP dumps without getting approval beforehand. And so this has created somewhat of a chilling effect in the area of measure, uh, TOR measurement since then. There hasn't really been a study uh, of, of this type since 2010, basically. There is, however, TOR metrics. And TOR metrics, TOR itself does measure and, and provide publicly, uh, public data about the, ne the network. So it takes a variety of different measurements from various nodes. Uh, some of them are opt-in statistics. Some of them are based on um, measurements that are done for performance reasons. I won't get into all of the measurements that are, are taken, but I will highlight a couple of issues. So some of these measurements have safety concerns. Um, there are per relay outputs that can be used to actually, that could pot potentially be used to uh, learn some information about a client that wouldn't otherwise, an uh, adversary wouldn't otherwise be able to learn. Also during these measurements, data is stored locally on the relays and that could be problematic for security reasons. And most of these measurements, while there is some attempt to provide privacy by rounding the data results or binning the data, uh, there's no privacy proofs of these, and so it's hard to guarantee, provide guarantees of how much privacy is being provided. Some of these measurements are also inaccurate uh, because every relay is doing the rounding and adding per relay noise. It's hard to say how much accuracy are we losing across the entire network. And as I mentioned, some of the, these are opt-in and there's only limited vantage points, um, which also makes them inaccurate. Uh, moreover, Tor Metrics doesn't measure everything that we want to collect. Uh, there's a variety of statistics that they don't measure precisely because they're not safe to measure. So some of the things that we would like to learn are th things about users, including how many unique users are using Tor at once, how long do they stay online, how often do they join and leave the network. Uh, for relays, what's their bandwidth capacity, how is their congestion and queuing delays changing over time, how many circuits are, are failing at which relays, are there denial of service attacks happening in the network, um, destinations, which websites are popular use, uh, destinations for Tor clients, which applications are popular, uh, what properties of different properties of traffic, like how many bytes are being used, both upstream and downstream uh, over Tor circuits. So this is some of the types of measurements that we hope to be able to gather. So next I'm gonna talk about uh, the system that we developed and uh, deployed in order to measure Tor. So I'm gonna talk about the architecture um, the protocol that it's using, and then a little bit about security of, of why this thing is safer than previous approaches. So uh, we designed a system called PrivCount. It's a privacy-preserving counting system. PrivCount consumes various types of events from the Tor process, such as circuits, streams, and connection end events. And then using that information, it counts various types of statistics such as the total number of circuits in the network, the total number of streams, the total number of connections. It also counts data volume per circuit and stream. Uh, we also count number of unique users connecting to our measuring nodes. So the protocol that uh, PrivCount is based on is the PrivX S2 secret sharing protocol from Alahi et al, which was published at CCS in 2014. So some security goals for PrivCount, uh, three of them are listed here. 
One is forward privacy, and this means that an adversary who can compromise one of the measurement nodes does not learn the state of the measurement before the time of compromise, okay? So he can learn what hap what's happening um, after that time, but not before. Uh, we're going to provide differential privacy, which prevents confirmation of actions of a specific user given the output of the measurement process. And then well, we'll provide secure aggregation. So this means that we can securely aggregate the statistics across all the measurement nodes. And the only thing that's learned from this process is the total final aggregated output. OK, and we'll revisit these three uh, properties after I describe how the system works. So there's three different types of priv count nodes. One is a data collector. Data collectors run on the same machine as a Tor relay. And they connect to Tor, the Tor process and consume events from Tor. And then they use that to increment different various types of counters. So this counting process is actually implemented inside of the, the data collector, which is a Python process. A second type of node is a tally server. Tally servers are central and untrusted proxy nodes that facilitate communication between the data collectors and the share keepers, which are the third type of, of node. The share keepers will store secrets from the data collectors during the measurement process, and then after the measurement process, the secrets will be sent to the tally server for aggregation. So the way this works, there's a few different steps. Uh, first, we set up a deployment, and this is done in the initialization phase. So my example here has only five priv count nodes, and I'm just gonna use this as a simple example. Obviously, we could have more data collectors um, in, a, in a real deployment. So to start a deployment, we create what's called a deployment document. This contains some information, uh, including privacy parameters, epsilon and delta, which will be used to provide differential privacy. Uh, it, it contains the sensitivity for each statistic, which is basically the maximum change allowed due to a single client, and it provides noise weights for the different data collectors. And again, this is done, uh, to, this is done in the uh, process of, differential, of computing differential privacy. So this deployment document is uh, computed at the beginning and then it is sent to all of the nodes in the network. And these privacy parameters should be analyzed by each of these nodes. And once each node is uh, uh, convinced that the privacy parameters don't break uh, privacy in the network, they can agree to the document and they make sure that they have the same version of the document as everyone else. And once they form a unanimous consensus, then this document is uh, accepted and the process can continue. And so at that point, we have a deployment that we can then use to, measure, to uh, perform different types of measurements. Okay, so once our deployment is set up, we can do several different measurement, measurement periods. And the measurement period starts with the configuration phase. So, so we create the deployment once, and we do multiple measurements from there. So the configuration document contains information specific to a, a single measurement phase, such as when should we start collecting data from Tor, when should we end, which statistics should we collect in a given measurement period, estimated values for each of these statistics, which will be used to maximize relative accuracy um, while providing differential privacy. And so again, this configuration document is sent to all the nodes in the network, and uh, each of the, the data collectors and share keepers will check this document for consistency to make sure that they each have the same version of the document and they don't have an outdated version. And once that consistency check passes across all the nodes, we can then proceed to the measurement. So the measurement starts uh, with, this is the execution phase, it starts with a setup process at the data collectors. So in this example, we're going to assume we're counting one thing, so like the number of circuits, for example. This counter is split between the, all of the, uh, the data collectors. They'll each be counting locally um, how many circuits they see at their, uh, their node. So we start by generating noise for each counter from the normal distribution, um, which contributes to differential privacy of the output. So the, both of these values uh, shown here are the state of the counter at, the, at this point. They just have noise added to them and nothing else. Then each data collector will generate a random share for each share keeper that's uh, uh, 
uh, configured in the network. This is from the uniform distribution. So this is basically a completely random number that's added into the counter for each of these nodes for each share keeper. And so after this point, this counter is blinded so that the actual count um, does, is not revealed uh, because it just looks like a random number at this point. So the data collectors then send their shares to each of the share keepers. Right? So each data collector connects to each share keeper. They each send one share to each of them. Uh, and then the data collector from that point on starts collecting events from the Tor process, uh, counting different statistics and adding them into the, these counters. So in this case, uh, this count will be the number of circuits. So each of these values that are shown here is, are just one number. Uh, I'm actually breaking out what values went into that number just for clarity, but they're just one number. And so uh, these numbers look more or less random from anyone who breaks into the, uh, one of the data collector machines. So uh, at the end of the collection process, each of these counter values are sent to the tally server. And from there, the tally server can combine all of the counters from the various nodes, it takes the data collector counters and subtracts off the share keeper counters. And so what will happen is these values that were added at the beginning will be canceled. And what, what's left is the noise from each data collector plus the actual counts from each data collector. And again, this is just one single number, so the tally server can't separate these out into per data collector um, values. And so the results, because of the noise that's included by each data collector, the results are differentially private, and this final value, this final tally is safe to publish um, publicly. Okay, so how does this achieve the security properties that I mentioned earlier? Recall where I mentioned forward privacy, differential privacy, and secure aggregation. So I'm going to bring up all of the nodes again and show you this, everything that they learned through this process. Okay, so uh, those values are shown here. So forward privacy, uh, for forward privacy, nothing is learned from the counter before the time of compromise as long as one share keeper is honest. And this is because in this example, the share keeper contain, uh, has a share value from each of the data collectors. And remember these share values are random numbers. So as long as one share keeper is honest, if an adversary breaks into one of the data collector machines, that random number of, of that share keeper is going to be included in the counter of that data collector. And so the, the result is that that data collector's counter value will appear random. Uh, so as long as one SK is honest, uh, that property holds. Uh, for differential privacy, enough noise is added as long as a, a tunable subset of DCs are honest. Because each DC is adding noise, um, we can set that uh, how we wish. So for example, if we did, uh, if the tunable subset was one, that means each data collector would add enough noise for differential privacy. And so if you have two data collectors, you're actually adding twice as much noise as you need but that means you can uh, allow one of the data collectors to be compromised and you'll still have differential privacy of the output. And this is tunable, so in a large deployment where you have multiple data collectors, you can choose uh, a subset that you want and there's a, a noise weight that can be used to adjust how much noise each data collector is added um, uh, and so that you'll still achieve differential privacy. Finally, secure aggregation, because of the previous two properties, the count plus the noise is added securely, and the TS will only learn the aggregated sum. So as long as we have one share keeper and this subset of data collectors that are honest, um, this final value is then securely aggregated. Uh, so I briefly just sketched uh, some of these security properties. I'll note that we did prove this secure in the UC framework, so please see the paper. Uh, if you're interested in detailed security and privacy proofs. Uh, so that covers the protocol. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the deployment that we ran and some of the results that we, that we found. So we, uh, in order to collect measurements on Tor, we ran seven Tor relays. We ran three 
data collectors on entry relays or guard relays, and we ran four exit relays. So our entry bandwidth was 0.16% on average during our collection periods, and our exit bandwidth was 1.1% uh, during our measurement periods. We ran one tally server and six share keepers from six different operators in four different countries. So uh, we did the deployment phase, and then we did multiple measurement phases using this deployment. So our relays were taking part in the Realtor network, and we were measuring things um, from there. So we did two different collection phases types. Uh, one type was an exploratory phase where we collected, uh, we explored various different exit policies and how the exit policies, we looked at how the exit policies would affect the results that we were, the measurement results that we were seeing. We also looked at various application types. Uh, we gathered only total numbers, so the total counts of number of streams, circuits, bytes, et cetera. And we ran these for short periods of time for one day and we iterated them uh, multiple times. We then ran uh, multiple in-depth fa phases. We ran one for client-side statistics, so like the number of users, and one for exit-side statistics. And we ran them for various days. We ran four days for client-side and 21 days for exit-side statistics. So some results. Uh, first, we'll show the exit policy results. So on these graphs, the x-axis shows the different exit policies. Default is the default policy that's shipped with Tor which blocks uh, some ports that are well-known to be used for file sharing. The open policy allows every single port, and the strict policy is the same as the default policy, but it also blocks 80 and 443. So the main thing to note here is that the difference between the default and the open policy is basically that the open policy allows some of these file sharing ports that are blocked by the default policy. And so in that case, you can see here on the first graph, the number of circuits that are created, the number of web circuits that are created um, stay relatively the same from default to open. But we see a spike in the number of other circuits uh, when changing from default to open. And so this is because we're allowing file sharing traffic. We're seeing a lot of circuits that are being used uh, for file sharing traffic, which makes sense. Similarly, for streams in the middle graph, we see that the number of web streams stay the same, but again, the number of other streams jumped uh, because of uh, the file sharing ports. The interesting thing, uh, while the number of web circuits and web streams stay the same, the, number of the amount of data transferred by, web by those web streams dropped significantly uh, in the case that we had the open policy. And the, number of other, or the amount of other traffic increased. So what this indicates is that the open file sharing ports that our exit relays were using actually consumed a, a larger proportion of the bandwidth that was available at our measuring relays, which crowded out the web traffic. Uh, so this was an interesting result that we found during our measurements. You'll also notice uh, in the legend I show interactive, which is a traffic class type that includes SSH and IRC ports, but you don't see any black bars. Actually, they exist. They're just so small that uh, they're hard to see. And so basically, interactive traffic is a very, very small percentage of all the Tor traffic that our measuring relays uh, observed. Uh, so next, I'll talk about the amount of traffic. So we use the results from our exploratory phases to extrapolate the total, given the exit policies, uh, each of the exit policies we tested, and the popularity of those exit policies across all of the exit relays, we extrapolated to total amounts of traffic uh, for the total, whole Tor network. And then we compare this to the other two studies I mentioned, one from 2008 and 2010. So the left, uh, left graph shows number of uh, percent of connections, and the right graph shows percentage of bytes. And the main thing I wanted to highlight here is that web, the number of bytes used for uh, web traffic for ports 80 and 443 have jumped uh, significantly since 2010. So 2010, it was about 42%. And in our data, we, looked, uh, we saw 91%. So I will say that this is port 80 and 443, so it's possible that more file sharing traffic is using those ports. Um, so there's still some work to be done here to try to understand exactly what's happening. But for our first analysis, this seems to indicate that web traffic is on the rise. Uh, this could be because uh, services like Netflix or Spotify are seeing increased usage and file sharing is just not used as much. But again, this is uh, future work to verify this. 
Finally, uh, we looked at the number of unique users connecting to our clients, uh, where unique was done by IP address. And we looked at this over 10, mi uh, 10 minutes, which is the same amount of time that the circuit is open. Uh, we did this to make sure that we weren't keeping those IP addresses, which are sensitive, in memory longer than the time that Tor would keep it in memory because it keeps it in memory for when the circuit is active. We looked at the dif uh, difference between active and inactive circuits. Uh, active and inactive users, sorry, which has never been looked at before uh, to the best of my knowledge. So what we found was we found 710,000 total users um, connecting to our measuring relays, and of those, 550,000, or about 77%, were active, while the remaining 23% were inactive. So presumably, they had their Tor browser open, they were making circuit connections, but they weren't actually using those circuits. And this was in an average 10 minutes, so this can be seen as roughly the number of, of users at any given time. So to compare this to some data that Tor Metrics publishes, they look at the number of concurrent users using Tor browser update pings. And from that estimate, we, we get a range of about 800,000 to 1.6 million. Um, and so this is close to the, the, range, the, the number that we were measured. Tor also similarly measures the number of daily users, which is the number I uh, talked about at the beginning of the talk, uh, based on consensus downloads. And from that, we see that there's 1.75 million daily users. Uh, so this shows that there's the, the Tor popula user population turns over roughly two to two and a half times per day. Um, and again, we're trying to look into this uh, for future, we're trying to look into this in the future to try to come up with better numbers here. Finally, uh, I will not go into the details here, but I just wanted to put this up to say there's a lot more results in the paper. We have various statistics that we measured, and there's a lot of data here, so please see the paper if you're interested in this. A lot of the, these statistics can be used for modeling purposes, um, so if this can be helpful to you, please see the paper. So in conclusion, we designed a distributed measurement system using secret sharing. We did a Tor measurement study. Uh, the system, PrivCount, is open source. It's on GitHub and it's available, so please see that if you're interested. We have a bunch of future plans for what to measure next, and we're planning to do that. Uh, my contact information is shown, and that's all I have. I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks for the interesting talk. We have time for some questions. Okay, so... Um... Matt Wright, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. The, um, can you comment a bit on the overhead and scalability, uh, particularly with the share servers? Yeah, the share keepers, uh, they do very little. All they do is receive a share value, which is just a small random number from each of the data collectors. And they hold on to that until the end of the measuring period. And they add those together. That's essentially the operation that they do. So it's very, very low overhead. I don't have like huh. raw numbers, you, but okay. do you that's know because it's so, like, it's so low that I didn't think it was worth measuring. How many do you think you would want to see run in practice in Tor? Not, not, I guess not because of overhead, but because you need how many to be secure, uh -huh. one of them to be honest. So. Yeah, so that's a good question. So we envision, if Tor runs this, we envision that the share keepers would be run on the directory authorities. There's nine directory authorities, and they have a majority security um, policy, so five of those have to be, you know, more than half of them have to be compromised in order to compromise Tor. So if we ran the share keepers there, we would have a similar, uh, we would get similar security properties from that. And then the data collectors could be run on whatever subset of the relays would be willing to run this um, software along with their, their relay. Uh, hi. Uh, nice talk, and thanks for making it open source. Uh, I'm Dionysus from the University of Athens. My question is, uh, okay, you're an ethical researcher and you're doing these differential privacy uh, defenses, but uh, I don't see any way of preventing an adversary from running the same counts without differential privacy defenses and extracting de-anonymizing data. Shouldn't we build Tor in a way that this data is not extractable at all, potentially? So is it possible? Yeah, so if an adversary runs these Tor relays now, it can already take all these measurements. It just doesn't have to use our system, right? It can just take all the logs, 
It can combine all the data that it wants. And so there's no privacy in that, in that system. So the only thing that we're trying to do is provide, is to prevent the adversary from being able to learn something from the honest relays that it can't learn already. And that's what this system is preventing against. So yeah, so if, if people are adversarial and they run relays, we can't stop them from doing what they're gonna do, but we can stop them from learning information from the other relays. Okay, thanks. So we can take one more question, but let's uh, let the next speaker set up. Benny Mayerhofer from Johannes Kepler University in Linz. How scalable is it from the collector's point of view? So um, can you imagine using that system for actually creating detailed statistics, detailed histograms on port usage? Like how many bytes are flowing via which port? Not just a few, not only a, a defined set of parameters that every DC agrees upon, but really finely granular. Yeah, so that depends on uh, the privacy that you want to provide, right? So if the more granular you get, the more noise you have to add. Or, or like you, you want to add a certain amount of noise to pro provide differential privacy. So if you're going to break out your statistics so that there's very few counts in each bin, then the relative noise is going to be higher because you don't have as much uh, actual data counts in each of those bins, right? So that means you could run this experiment for longer, measure results over a longer period of time so that the relative accuracy decreases. Uh, but that's a trade-off, right? So you could certainly do that, but there's trade-offs involved with that. I also meant the um, overhead in terms of network communication. If you have like 500 different parameters that you measure on each node, then uh, what does that mean towards actually aggregating all that? Okay, so like I said, so all of the data that's coming from Tor into the priv count, that's over the local host, so that's not really, we don't have to worry about that overhead. Uh, the data that's being aggregated is, are just these numbers being sent around. So if you have, yeah, so if you have like 100 statistics, you're sending 100 essentially long integers to each of the data collectors. So this is, I think this is very small compared to like the total overhead of Tor itself, for example. Let's thank the speaker again.